Uh, as she said, I'm going to be uh, talking about uncommon allies, uh, farmers and environmental groups uh, working together. Um, this is something that we started trying at Minnesota Soybean Growers Association when I got hired. Um, get into that a little bit, I guess. I am the uh, Director of Public Affairs at Minnesota Soybean. I started there in 2013. I, I am the lead staff on uh, two action teams, our Environmental Stewardship Action Team and our Advocacy Action Team. Uh, basically, I'm doing all of the uh, fun stuff up at the Capitol with our lobbyists or working on all the environmental stuff, all the other fun stuff. So uh, Minnesota Soybean, most of you in the room probably know, it's two separate entities. On the MSGA side, uh, or the research side, that's the checkoff. That's where we're doing our research, our international market development, industry type activities, new uses. And then the Growers Association side is our membership side. We're a federal checkoff, unlike corn. Uh, not one single checkoff dollar can go to advocacy. So the membership is where we raise our money uh, to lobby at the Capitol to do the work, uh, hiring A.J. Dewar and Corey Bennett, our lobbyists, uh, who actually go up to the Capitol and, and do that work. I'm a city kid. I grew up in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. Uh, nowhere near a farm. I grew up in the middle of a McMansion development. This is my farm experience which the last few days would have looked pretty good, but that's damn near zero. When I was about seven years old, I drove a small green tractor through a fence on my great uncle's hog farm in Missouri, by, by outside of St. Louis, which they sold shortly after that, and that is the extent of my farming experience. I'm an environmental attorney. I went to the University of St. Thomas, I majored in environmental studies, went to Hamlin School of Law after that, got a Juris Doctorate there, focused mainly on environmental law issues, Native American law issues. I ended up moving out to Connecticut. My wife is a doctor, so she did a residency out there, and I worked for Yale for a few years. And while there, I got my graduate law degree. I was stupid enough to go back for an extra year of law school to specialize in environmental law. That's the LLM Pace School of Law in White Plains, New York. Uh, as I said, I worked for Yale for a few years. Uh, while I did the, the LLM and while my wife was out there, we moved back to Mankato in 2007. I got a job down in Jackson uh, working for Judge Titus as a law clerk. Worked there for about a year and a half or so and then ended up as a Martin County attorney. So I worked in Martin County for a few years as an assistant county attorney and then in Nicollet County before joining the Minnesota Soybean Growers. So now you guys know who I am. I am not a farm kid at all. I am one of those dirty hippie guys. As some people call me, I am Tree Hugger Esquire. I am one of those uh, people that are in these environmental groups. I've spent most of my life uh, belonging to environmental groups, working with environmental groups. Uh, in law school, I wrote a paper on animal rights, which was published. I have written on environmental justice and gotten published. So I, I know these issues. I know what they're working towards uh, very intimately. And that being said, even though I wrote a paper on environmental or in animal rights, my favorite way to eat soybeans is to feed them to a pig first. So this is what you're dealing with at a federal level. I know that's hard to read. This is Wikipedia. This is not an exhaustive list at all. But these are what Wikipedia lists as the federal environmental groups. This is not the Minnesota environmental groups. This is at the federal level. For every single one of these, we probably have a chapter in Minnesota of one of these plus a few more, like the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy is not on here, and a bunch of our little local Seven Mile Creek Watershed, Friends of the Watershed, Friends of the Mississippi River, Friends of the Minnesota River, they're not up here. But these are all the groups that are, are working mainly against a lot of what farmers are doing nowadays. So what are some of the things that these guys have accomplished? Again, this is hard to read, and I apologize for that, but it's mainly meant to make a point. You, starting back in 1948, you have the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. You have the Clean Air Act. You have the NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act. You have FIFRA, FICRA, all of the RICRA, all those fun uh, laws that we get to deal with now, all these major environmental laws. And they continue. They continue to work, and you see the 
EPCKRKA, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, Superfund Act, Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. So they've done a lot. In Minnesota, right now currently, I mean buffers, buffers are the issued de jure for the last four or five years. We passed a deadline, but that's still, that fight's still going. Uh, that fight is still happening. We're still working on, on the buffer issue. We have pollinators. There's a, a governor task force on pollinators that comes up with crazy ideas every single time that they meet. Roadside mowing. I'm part of the roadside mowing task force, and there's a few environmental groups on that, and they, they keep coming up with new ideas and new uh, ways that farmers shouldn't, you know, they, they're not only shouldn't you be able to mow the roadside, but maybe you should leave a buffer next to the roadside for habitat is their latest plan. The nit nitrogen fertilizer rule is another thing going on, and, and the nutrient reduction plan. So these groups are very active in the state of Minnesota. Uh, when I, w I was asked to talk this year, um, they kind of they said, "Well, what do you, what do you want to talk about tonight?" I gave them a list of ideas, and I was surprised that they picked this topic. I uh, talked about feedlot siting rules and some other stuff because generally, I know working with my farmers, uh, this is how they felt about the idea when I said, "Let's try to work with some of these environmental groups." Uh, you know, they they've kind of been there, done that, banged their head against the wall enough times, and uh, they were they were getting sick of it. So. When we were talking about this, it wasn't simply um, a plan where we, we just jumped right into it. This took a couple of years, actually, to create and craft and to get to a point where our, the, our farmers, the Minnesota Soybean Grower Association, were ready and, and willing to do this type of thing. And there were really important reasons for that. They had, you know, people had been approached by environmental groups before. People had said, yeah, let's work with them, and people had gotten burned. So we went through a, a series kind of of meetings and talking about how we were going to do this and how we were going to strategically start this process. And these are the four main considerations that I came up with. You need to look at the mission statement of the group that you're looking to work with. And you need to look at your own mission statement and see if there's a, a good match there. You need to see what your goals are on this project. What do you want at the end of the day? Knowing that they're still going to exist and you're still going to exist, and you may not agree on everything, can you reach some of the, the goals uh, that you may have in common? The reaction. What's the reaction going to be to your members, to your, the other farm groups, the farmers that you work with, uh, and the ends? And by this, I don't mean the ends justifying the means, whether or not you're going to be able to reach your goal, but what, what happens at the end? Is there money left over? Is there, you know, clout to be gained? Can that clout be turned against you? Some of the reasons that, you know, these things had failed in the past. Um, making sure you look at this. And a big part of this uh, came with a way in, you know, we deal with uh, telling our story at Minnesota Soybean now. And, you know, Pork, the Pork Cares website that's listed on that little thing, it does a really good job of, of telling the story, telling your story, but, you know, like I said, I'm a city kid. You know, if Dave Preisler's in the room, why Dave grows pigs the way he grows to make money, I don't care about that as a city kid. I really don't care about that at all. I want to know what's Dave doing to make sure that the food is safe. What's Dave doing to make sure that the, the pigs are happy until you kill them for whatever reason that's important to some people. Um, what, 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 what's in it for me kind of thing. So everybody likes to hear stories, and you know, it's a very important part of being a lawyer is being able to tell a story to the jury. And that story, everybody wants to tell the story, they, you know, your initial reaction is to tell the story with you as the main character. Most people don't like that story because they're not you. What they want to hear is a story where they're the main character. And in the story, you are the Oscar winner best supporting actor. What are you doing for me? And finding these groups where those stories, they can be the best supporting actor for your story, you can be the best supporting actor for their story, that's really where the win-win comes in. And if that can't happen, it's really not worth it. So uh, another consideration is the environmental groups themselves. Uh, obviously, they're, they're very varied. Um, groups are, you know, just like I work for Minnesota Soybean, there's Minnesota Corn, Minnesota Wheat. We're all focused on different issues. They have their different issue as well. 
Uh, most of them have this dedicated focus that they were created with. Uh, few of them have detailed knowledge outside of that focus area. And what I talk about when I, talk, when I say that is, you know, their individual members may be a farmer, their individual members may have this knowledge, may have knowledge beyond what they're actually trying to accomplish at the end of the day. But the group as a whole probably doesn't. So, you know, for example, Minnesota soybean doesn't have any policy on what pollinator plants to, to grow. It's just not something that we care about. It's so some of these things are just things that their group as a whole hasn't thought about. A big thing I see is a lack of farm economy knowledge for these guys. We, we hear a lot when we were doing the school bond, uh, school building tax break, you know, that, well, why don't you just pass the costs on to your customers? It's McDonald's in St. Peter it's a, gets a tax increase. They raise the price of French fries by a penny. Nobody notices. Nobody, everybody pays. They probably make up more money by selling French fries than they do at the end of the day. And you have to tell these people, well, that's great, but if you go into the co-op and say, well, my soybeans cost 15 cents a bushel more because I have a, ta a tax, the elevators can say, great, you can turn around and take those soybeans back to your farm. They're not going to pay that extra. And having that knowledge helps them understand why you're trying to get to where you're getting on some of these issues because uh, most of them just don't have that knowledge. Another problem we face is many of them have forgotten why they were created in the first place. Uh, there seems to be, on the green side, a race to inclusivity. Like they're trying to take on any and every issue. So you see environmental groups now that are worried about minimum wage. You see environmental groups that are worried about social justice issues and the Black Lives Matter stuff because they've, they've forgotten what they're there for, which makes working with them very difficult. So now you guys are probably wondering, is this guy going to be able to teach us how to work with any and every group? No. There are going to be some groups that you are just not going to get along with. You are not going to be able to work with these groups. And these groups I call the problem groups, not because they are a problem, even though most of them are a problem, but they are interested in the problem. They are not interested in the solution. Problems equal dollars to them. If there's a problem, people give money. If there's a problem, celebrities donate lots of money and time and effort to their group. If you have a solution, that means they need to find a new job. And they don't want a new job. They're making lots of money doing what they do. So these groups, uh, the, you're just never going to be able to partner with them on, on anything. And they're not, we're not alone in that. There are some groups that the environmental groups don't get along with. This is a, a vegan uh, advertisement or thing from social media, a vegan group that doesn't like Sierra Club Greenpeace and Rainforest Network action because they, they think they're not tough enough on the agricultural and the animal agricultural groups. So this is an environmental group. That's why they were started, was a, a be vegan to, to go green. And they don't even get along with, with other environmental groups, so there's no way we're going to get along with them. So getting into uh, how we've started dabbling our toes into this, the first one that we, we really saw a no-brainer um, connection here was biodiesel. Um, Biodiesel in the state of Minnesota uh, started with the first legislation was passed in 2002 requiring a 2% uh, blend of biodiesel into diesel fuel. And that law was implemented in 2005. In 2008, the legislature created what we, we're now dealing with, the regulatory system we're dealing with with biodiesel now, in which we have a 5% year round. Uh, we ramped up to 10% in uh, 2014, I believe, and then this next May, in the summer months, it'll be 2000, or it'll be B20. So we, it'll still be in the winter months B5, but in the summer months we go to B20. This law, both laws, 2% and the current law, were passed with a lot of support on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the current law was passed under by Governor Pawlenty, but um, both of the ramp ups to B10 and B20 have been acted and with support of Governor Dayton and his administration. 
Uh, the primary purpose of the law, and there was a lawsuit that dealed with this, and the court said, yes, this is the primary purpose of the law, was to boost rural economies and to help Minnesota farmers with commodity prices. Uh, it did not have to do with clean air. But one of our biggest supporters in passing these laws was the American Lung Association in Minnesota, uh, mainly focused on human health and the human impacts that the cleaner burning biodiesel would have on Minnesota citizens rather than any type of environmental effect. So as I said, the B20 mandate now takes effect starting this May. Uh, during the last legislative session, the biodiesel mandate came under attack once again. Uh, we saw a couple bills introduced that would basically gut the mandate, put the oil companies in charge of it. So if they decided there wasn't biodiesel, um, say because, you know, they didn't buy any, uh, then the, the mandate went down to zero. So it basically nullified the mandate. American Lung Association of Minnesota was there to help us again, uh, along with all the, the farm groups, major farm groups were there to help us support this. However, we heard from a few different legislators that they just couldn't support this. And the reason that they couldn't support the biodiesel mandate uh, was just what I saw a new attack this morning on NPR about deforestation and food, food versus fuel. And these arguments that they just don't, they don't really make a lot of sense. And it's, you know, it's fueled by, we know who it's fueled by. It's fueled and funded by big oil. Big oil uses a tactic that we see the environmental groups use against us all the time. It's the use of egg on egg violence. So here we have, again, this is the vegan people uh, attacking the meat industry, but they basically pit dairy against the almond industry, and which one is using more water. And we see it often with the ethanol, renewable fuels in general, this food versus fuel, and you know, trying to, to pit egg against each other. When we were up at the legislature talking about buffers, we saw what I would call the super farmers. And I put farmer in, in quotations there because I've seen, all, I've seen farmers who are double pensions, um, inherit, move back to the farm late in life. They're using it basically as a hunting preserve, but they have some corn or soybean out there. Uh, they don't need the farm income. They're not a quote unquote farmer. They're not a production agriculture farmer but they're put up there and testify about how big their buffers are. Well, their buffers are that big because they have people coming out to hunt in them. They're not running a farm, they're running a hunting operation, or their kids come out and hunt in them. One of uh, the guys that we, we saw testify has a trust fund. He's, he's very, very rich, and he runs his farm in a way in which nobody could make money. He, he has three rows of beans, three rows of corn, then three rows of beans, then three rows of corn. You can't make money doing that. It's, it's ridiculous. But they put them up there as a farmer and then say, see, farmers support this. So I don't know why these other farm groups are, are you, know, hang, you know, complaining about it. You see the same thing with the animal welfare people. You'll find one person who has their pigs outside and running around and doing whatever, and they think that's great, and then they try to put that standard on everybody. Uh, one of the... Other ones we heard was a guy that was not grow, was not successful as a crop row farmer. So he uh, had basically sold everything, sold all his equipment, and he got into a very niche market of grass-fed beef that he's selling to restaurants in Chicago and New York. And now he's making more money than ever. And that's a great story for him. And he was putting this out there that, you know, everybody should do it. And when asked if everybody did this and the supply went way up, what would happen to your prices? He said, well, I wouldn't be able to make any money. Exactly. So, uh, you know, buffers, we had a lot of farmers that voiced, you know, I have buffers on my farm. You know, yeah, I've got buffers. And they're talking about the buffers that they have put in under NRCS technical guidelines. One guy was talking about his 10 and a half foot buffer because that's what the precipitation and slope called for under that guideline. He was not talking about the governor's 50 foot buffer, but that was used as sea farmers support this, this buffer law. Uh, pollinators uh, is another very classic example of this egg on egg violence. Po you know, most of the commercial beekeepers, that's a, that's a form of agriculture. Uh, but, and we've had beekeepers that tell us that their most successful beehives are the ones next to corn and soybean fields. They have great relationship with those farmers. They work really well. 
They don't know why everybody else is getting ginned up. But then you have three beekeepers in the city of Minneapolis who had their bees killed by a fungicide put on ornamental trees. They're beekeepers too. And so they come out and they testify that big ag is killing, even though it wasn't big ag that killed their hives. And that gets turned into beekeepers are against corn and soybean farmers. So uh, in looking at the biodiesel issue, we, we needed to find somebody else. What these legislators needed was somebody on that environmental side that they could hang their environmental credit on, that they could say, look, I, the environmentalists are for this. Kind of the same thing that they were doing to us, we tried to do in reverse. And we found the Center for Energy and Environment. The Center for Energy and Environment is a clean energy nonprofit that promotes energy efficiency to strengthen the economy while improving the environment. And they wrote a letter of support for us March 25th, 2017 to the Minnesota House that was holding, which at this point was just an informational hearing on biodiesel. Uh, we successfully pushed the hearing past the, uh, our lobbyists successfully pushed the hearing past the deadline. So it was just an informational hearing. It was very much against uh, biodiesel, but uh, they helped write a letter of support. And I just put up some quotes here that to, to show you that they put, simply put, when users burn biodiesel, they are reducing the amount of greenhouse gases released into the air. The current use of B10, 10% biodiesel in the summer, and B5, 5% in the winter is equal to removing the emissions of 128,000 passenger vehicles from Minnesota's roadways. According to the American Lung Association of Minnesota, a move to B20 in the summertime blend increases the number to nearly 202,000 vehicles removed from our roadways. CEE is driven by innovation in the energy sector, reducing the carbon intensity of liquid fuels while maintaining energy density is critical importance to protecting our way of life and the environment. To this end, the US EPA recognizes biodiesel as the first and only advanced biofuel for its ability to reduce greenhouse gases by more than 50% compared to traditional diesel. Lastly, of particular interest to our organization, biodiesel is very efficient to produce. CEE focuses on efficiency because efficiency is fundamentally about increasing economy productivity, economic productivity. According to the National Biodiesel Board, a latte takes 26 times more water to produce than a gallon of biodiesel. That's a staggering number, especially for a state committed to improving water quality standards. The biggest thing about those last three quotes is they all quoted things that we quote the National Biodiesel Board, and the American Lung Association of Minnesota. There was nothing really new in that that these legislators hadn't heard, but I was personally told by legislators that it mattered because of who was saying them. If it's us saying them, we have an economic interest, CEE, they don't have an economic interest in this, they're not doing this because of that, they're doing this because of some altruistic goal of reducing greenhouse gas and promoting energy efficiency and energy independence. So for them to be, hear those statistics or be able to say, hey, look, an environmental group is doing it, really changed the way uh, that they looked at it. Um, next step, some of the things that have grown out of this. CEE designs and implements efficiency programs for utilities, provides low interest financing to businesses and individuals, conducts original research to identify tomorrow's clean energy strategies, and work with policymakers to advance energy efficiency in Minnesota. So we looked at that and said this, could, this partnership could go beyond biodiesel, way beyond biodiesel, and particularly to animal agriculture. Uh, through their use of energy audi audits to develop plans for businesses to reduce energy costs. This same group currently works with a group in, in, in uh, Iowa and with the University of Minnesota to conduct on-farm evaluations. And they, you know, basically looking at your on-farm on energy use, how can you reduce your energy costs? Uh, we, I followed along with them while they did an energy evaluation of a farm in northern Iowa. Farmer was spending about $3,000 a month on energy cost uh, through their planning and their low interest rate loans for him to get some solar panels. Yeah, they lowered that down to about $650 a month on energy costs because of the low interest rate loans and the, the ability of, for them to put in solar panels and to, to leverage their networks to get these things installed uh, on a farm rather than what they normally were focused on was cities. They've never really, CEE started as a 
Office of Min uh, City of Minnesota Environmental Office program. It started in the city, so they've been focused on the city, and they've kind of forgot that we're out there. So we're starting to have, help them get into that market a little bit more. As I mentioned, they're already working with legislators. They already have legislators that really like them, mainly those urban legislators where they were created here in Minneapolis, the people that don't necessarily know us, don't necessarily always like us. So using their relationship to get into them is also, you know, it's been a huge help to us on some of these issues. And lastly, uh, the guy we worked with in this, uh, Joe Sullivan, he was the manager of strategic relations at CEE. Um, you know, in full disclosure, he's a really good friend of mine, and I am now his treasurer because now Joe Sullivan is running for Congress. He's running to take over Tim Walz's spot. So the guy that just said all that nice thing about biodiesel, said all those nice things that wrote the letter that I read the quotes from, could potentially be a congressman. So we have positioned ourselves with him in a good light as far as what farmers do and what, what farmers are doing on the farm for the environment and energy. So the next case study, uh, this is Buckthorn. Buckthorn as the DNR states, is, uh, was first brought to Minnesota from Europe in the mid-1800s as a very popular hedging material. Shortly after its introduction, it was found to be quite invasive in natural areas. Nursery industry stopped selling it, but many buckthorn hedges may still be found in older neighborhoods throughout Minnesota, especially in my yard. I own three acres in uh, Mankato, Minnesota. When I first moved in, uh, it's a, it abuts a public park. So I, I pulled all of the buckthorn out when I moved in. That was 10 years ago, and now you can't tell I did a single thing. I've, you know, in the meantime, I have kids. I'm busy. I don't have time to, to go in there, and it's all back. So this is a very invasive species. Very, uh, it all competes things. Um, it's just a, a nasty plant. It, it wrecks a lot of native habitat. So you're probably wondering. Okay, whoop de doo Never had to pull buckthorn out of my soybean field. Never had to pull buckthorn out of my cornfield. This is what it has to do with farmers. This is the soybean aphid. And in the summer months, the soybean aphid, as we know, goes to the soybean plants. And it sits there and it eats and it gets to threshold and you guys need to, farmers need to spray. In the winter, those little guys get wings and they fly to buckthorn. Buckthorn is the only identified in Minnesota overwintering host for soybean aphids. So they go and they plant their little eggs on the buckthorn. The eggs hatch in the spring. They overwinter there as eggs. They, they hatch in the spring. They spend their first few generations on the buckthorn, eating the buckthorn, until the soybean plants are mature. There's some signal, I don't know what it is, that they, the aphids get. I'm a lawyer, not an entomologist. It tells them, okay, guys, it's time to sprout wings and go to the soybean plants. Uh, they go to the soybean plants, and the cycle just keeps on repeating itself. So we looked, and this was another wonderful egg, you know, giving somebody ammunition. This is from the University of Iowa. They put this picture up of themselves spraying soybean aphids. So this is the traditional what we get of picture of soybean aphids, and we want to change that. So we looked at how we can change that issue. And so soybean aphids like buckthorn are an invasive species. Uh, we looked around and we found that there are a lot of environmental groups out there that don't like invasive species. And then we thought, is there a way to leverage this work uh, that we can do to figure this out? But we had a lot of still unanswered questions about the soybean aphid. So in New York, uh, they don't have a lot of soybean aphids. Pennsylvania has a lot of soybean aphids. Pennsylvania doesn't have a lot of buckthorn. New York does have a lot of buckthorn. And they were able to show the wind currents and the, late, the weather patterns out there. New, Pennsylvania's aphids are coming from New York. So are our aphids coming from our buckthorn, which we know in Minnesota we have a lot of, or are our aphids coming from buckthorn in Illinois, Wisconsin, or Michigan? We don't know the answer to that question. So Minnesota Soybean said, man, we, we'd really like to know that answer. We'd like to figure that out. Well, our, our checkoff is set at a certain amount, and we don't have a lot of extra dollars to put into the kind of research that this 
decade that does. Luckily for us, the legislature created a few years ago the Minnesota Investive Invasive Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center. The center was created by the legislature and given over $4 million to conduct research. So we looked at that and said, geez, what do we want them conducting research on? Do we want them conducting research on something that's going to hurt agriculture or something that can help agriculture? So we reached out to them. Luckily, the same time they had looked at us as a potential source of money to leverage their $4 million, and they reached out to us. And so we were able to come up with a collaboration to look at exactly some of these issues that we need looked at. And they're getting away money from us to help look at some of the things that they needed to look at. Like, like I said, I, I pulled three acres of buckthorn by hand. It took me a long time. It was a lot of work. The reason I haven't done it again is because it took a long time and it was a lot of work, and I don't want to do it. So they're doing research into, can we find somebody else to do it? And it turns out goats will eat damn near anything, and goats will eat buckthorn. They'll eat everything, and they'll take it out. So we're doing research with the University of Minnesota to see uh, you know, how many goats we need, what, what's the population of goats we need to do to take that out. And along with that study, where are these aphids coming from? We're getting our question answered. Are these aphids coming from those plots right near the farm? Are they coming from states farther away? When we eliminate small plots, uh, what do we do after elimination to prevent what happened in my yard, the buckthorn coming back? What can we plant? How do we do this? And some of that research with the goats is, is exactly that. They, the goats don't knock the plant down. They eat the leaves off. The leaves start growing back. They eat the leaves off again, and the plant dies standing there. So then you still have to have somebody go in and cut it off. Well, they're looking at if you cut off those branches and you mark the female trees and put the dead branches around the, the base of that female tree where the seed bank is, you can effectively kill the seed bank. And then they're looking at what can we plant that will grow quick in those areas that are disturbed now uh, with no vegetation. What can we plant that's native that will outcompete that buckthorn? Because buckthorn's not everywhere in the state. And so they're, they're looking at some of these, these issues that we, you know, have. We wouldn't have had the money to do on our own, uh, but working with the environmental group, we're able to do it. Now, that being said, there are groups that have found out we're interested in buckthorn because of the aphids. And they've come to us and wanted a lot of money. Uh, one of them was Friends of the Mississippi River. And they want money to remove buckthorn habitat. We like removing buckthorn habitat because that removes aphid habitat. But they keep jumping 10 steps ahead. They, they, we still need the questions answered that we need answered about, are these close buckthorn, is this far away buckthorn? And then the other thing that really scares our farmers uh, in my, in me, myself, is that we're not comfortable yet giving them money to do that because we don't know what's going to happen with the extra money, if there is extra money, and we can't control that. Working with a group like the University of Minnesota, it's pretty easy to, to be able to say if there's extra money on funding, it's going to go to research. It's going to go to, to something that we, we can help control, we can like. Uh, at the end of the day, Friends of Mississippi River, if there's extra money in a project, it may go to lobby for bigger buffers. We, we don't know. So we haven't been able to, you know, this isn't a, a perfect world, and that will lead us into a case study number three, pollinators. He's dying out, and it's your problem. You're not going to have any food to eat. Oh, no, boo-hoo. Um, so pollinators, agricultural groups a few years faced very heavy pressure to do something to help pollinators. When we were faced with this pressure, we looked around to see what can we do to, um, to kind of take some of this pressure off. And the key for our group was, what can we do to take this pressure off without losing farmland? We definitely did not want to lose any of our farmland. We're losing enough of it the way it is to development. So we looked around. We found a group that had land in the state of Minnesota. They had a lot of land in the state of Minnesota, pheasants forever. Research came out on the cropland use of the pheasant and how pheasants nest near cropland in grassy areas but then the chicks spend most of their time in those corn and soybean fields eating the bugs and growing. So if the, chicks, the, the cropland is actually very integral into the pheasant survival. But like I said, 
Uh, this came from Pheasants Forever themselves. It's fair to say that Governor Mark Dayton shocked the vast majority of hundreds of conservationists, hunters, and fishermen who were gathered at the January 2015 DNR Roundtable when he stood before them and announced his plans to push for legislation that would require 50-foot vegetative buffers around all waters in the state. The proposal was, in part, an outgrowth of the 2014 Minnesota Pheasant Summit in Marshall in the southwestern part of the state. The buffer was still there. So we still had to check the checklist. It, it's similar to what, we're, what I just talked about with Friends of the Mississippi River. The mission statement. They had a habitat mission. We had a need for habitat. They had our goals. You know, they want to improve the habitat that they had. They want to get more pollinator habitat out there. They want to get back in good graces with farm groups. Uh, we wanted to alleviate some of this pressure from the pollinator stuff. So if we can get this pollination, pollinator habitat out there on the landscape and increase the acreage so we can go to the legislature and tell them, look, we, we helped get X amount of pollinator habitat back on the landscape. We, we gave it the office, leave us alone. Um, those two were met. Reaction. We had very mixed reaction from our farmer leaders that were at the table. Um, half of them, frankly, were for it, thought this was a good idea to let bygones be bygones and move on. Um, most of those guys were pretty active in their Pheasants Forever chapters, kind of knew that their local chapters weren't supporting it. Uh, the other half of the farmers said, no, you know, the, the slide I just showed about this came out of the Pheasant Summit, the Pheasants Forever supported this buffer, this is a pheasant idea, uh, we can't do it. So we kind of had a mixed reaction. We knew we were going to have a mixed reaction, but the, really it was the ends that, again, didn't justify uh, what, what was going to happen if there was extra money? What was going to happen if, you know, what, where were the safeguards in place that checkoff dollars weren't going to be used for some pro-pheasant thing that was going to hurt farmers? We needed that uh, from them. They couldn't guarantee that. So we basically had to, to walk away from this, this project. So where do we head next? Uh, here's, I love this cartoon because, you know, it, there is... I, I think climate change is real. I know other people don't. So even if we do all these things, you know, we, get, we have green jobs, we have sustainability, we have livable cities, we have cleaner air, healthier children. What if we're doing this all for nothing? What if it's just a big hoax and we make the world a better place for nothing? It's still a better place. So can we work with these groups? I think yes. Whether or not you believe in climate change, whether or not you think it's man-made, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, these groups want to eliminate fossil fuel use. Well, guess what? We've got two great products to take their place. We have ethanol and we have biodiesel. We can definitely help you guys eliminate fossil fuel use by increasing the use of these farmer-created, Minnesota-grown products. They want to lower or eliminate power plant emissions. Guess what? You can partner with us to help reduce our on-farm energy costs, our on-farm energy use, uh, to get solar panels to, to out there so that we're, we're taking, you know, reducing our energy bills. That's a win-win. You guys want to do that? Hey, we're, we're welcoming it. They want more carbon sequestration. There's been some national groups that have talked with these, these types of groups about, okay, if you want more carbon sequestration, why don't you pay what you think that carbon sequestration is worth on top of a CRP or on top of another program so that we're making way more money off that bad farmland by sequestering carbon there and letting plants grow or trees grow <clears throat> or whatever the, the group wants. Uh, take that farmland out of production that you know you're losing money on and putting into something more po profitable. Water quality. Another big uh, issue in the state. Obviously, Governor Dayton's still around here for a little bit it's going to still be a huge issue. Most of the water quality groups want less nitrates in the water. I have not yet met the corn or soybean farmer putting nutrients out there saying, geez, I hope this creates that dead zone in the Gulf. I hope that it doesn't get into my plant, but kills those shrimp down in the Gulf of Mexico. They want less soil in the water. Again, never met a farmer that said, geez, my, my soil here would make a very fine barrier island down by Louisiana. No, we, we want to keep that in the field. They want less fertilizer and chemicals use. Less inputs mean more profits. So if these groups can help put their money, rather than going to the legislature, to lobby the legislature to say, hey, <clears throat> make farmers stop using as much chemicals. 
if we can reach out to them and leverage those dollars that we would spend lobbying against that and they would spend lobbying for it into research, into finding out exactly how do we use less inputs? How do we do more precision egg? How do we get precision egg to every single farm on the state? How, you know, can we do grants? Can your organization do grants? Instead of paying for lobbyists, sorry, AJ, uh, instead of paying for lobbyists, let's pay for farmers to get these precision egg things out into the fields so that they are using less nutrients and that they are using less uh, inputs, making more money along the way. But you have to see it from my side. This is the, the, what I was talking about earlier. You need to find the mutual story. Uh, usually I give this presentation to environmental groups, not to farm groups. And it's about how do you work with farmers? Because I, I do. I'm an environmental guy and I ended up working with farmers. And it's finding that story that works for both of you. So it's exactly those last few slides. When we come back to our farmers, we can talk about we're losing, using less inputs. We're keeping our soil in the fields. That, that's the story that the farmers want to hear because it, the main character in that story is them. You're making more money. Your profitability is going up. At the same time, I can go tell that story to environmental groups that we're using less inputs. The less inputs that we use to kill aphids, that's less byproduct killing pollinators. That's a story that they want to hear. That's what they care about. So it, it, it's those win-win stories that you need to find. Some issues in some groups, like I said before, they're just never going to be compatible. HS, US, PETA, uh, those types of groups, they're never going to be compatible. MCEA, not going to be compatible. I was told by an environmental group here in Minnesota, uh, when I first started, we came up with, uh, we had a really easy solution to a problem, kind of chuckled, and he told me straight up, right to my face, if we solve this problem, I won't have my job. He was not interested in the solution. He's interested in the problems. Those groups we're just never going to be able to work with. Those, dollar, those problems equal donations, solutions equal unemployment. And identifying those groups and calling them out on that is very key. We've tried to do that um, as publicly as we can um, to just point out that here, you know, we've got a solution. We're trying to work with group X, Y, and Z, and they're not interested in it. If that's the case, people should know that. So now, why, why would the environmental groups want to work with us? Going back to that list uh, of, it was hard to read, of all their accomplishments, the last major piece of federal environmental legislation was in 1990. That was, a, that was the last one. The other things on the list were like the Kyoto Protocol, Paris Climate Accords, some of the other things the groups had worked on. And they'd worked on some major legislation that they just weren't even able to get it passed. And this is despite, since 1990, we've had few years that were Democratic President, Democratic Senate, Democratic House. They were still not able to get their environmental legislation passed. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. And a big one, uh, I was able to go to a presentation just recently here in Minneapolis by uh, Frederick Rich. Uh, talking about getting to green, saving nature, a bipartisan solution. And he pointed out that, you know, back in the 1940s and the 1960s, some of the loudest voices for clean water were farm groups because you didn't have, you, you know, you had the Cuyahoga River on fire. You can't have your cattle drinking from that river. You can't have that, you know, acid rain falling on your crops. Uh, it was killing things. So they, they had that bipartisan approach. They had the farm groups and they had the environmental groups. And he pointed out the same thing that I did earlier with some of the, a lot of these problems with these environmental groups. They try to pass environmental legislation and they want to then tack on a, you know, a social justice issue to that legislation. They wanted to tack on some, you know, a different kind of uh, rights for different communities. They wanted to tack on these things because they had missed their focus. So there are environmentalists out there, uh, like Mr. Rich, that are realizing that they have a big problem right now, that with the legislature and, and things they have, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments should not be the last major legislation passed in the, in the federal government, but it is. So while at a state level we've seen some success, we've seen the buffers, we've seen some failures from those groups, on a national level they're starting to feel the pressure from this stuff. And, and that's really where we can hopefully leverage the, um, some of these groups to, to work together and to, to help us.